Good morning, everybody. And thank you again for worshiping with us here at Calvary Baptist Church in Allentown. We hope the day finds you well. As you can see here at the church, we're filming this on Saturday. The weather is amazing, 63 degrees. Uh, today, Pastor Marty will be continuing his series on the I Am Messages of Christ. We hope that you find the message enlightening and encouraging in these times that we're living in. And then we hope that you take advantage of these videos and your phones to call one another to keep worshiping and fellowshipping together. Right, Athena? Right? Right? All right. Next, we will have a music provided by the Matlock family, followed by Pastor Marty's message on I Am the Way the truth and the life. Thank you for joining us again. Good morning, saints of God. Good morning, Calvary, on this wonderful Sunday morning of March 29th, 2020. We praise God for this another day, for this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. These are tough times, but God indeed is in control. To begin our time of worship, we are reminded of Paul's letter to the current church. When he said vividly, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. 
find this in 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 9. As a songwriter says, in times like these, we need the Savior. In times like these, we need the Bible. In times like these, we need an anchor. Be very sure, be very sure, our anchor holds and grips the solid rock. Our Lord, God Almighty, we bless you this day because you're God. Ask the Lord that you make us to be strong and to realize, Lord, that even in situations that we don't understand, we can be assured that you do understand and that you will strengthen us and give us your peace and joy and strength to make us steadfast in that liberty wherewith you have set us free. Just ask, Lord, that you come and take control at this time, even as Pastor Marty shares with us your word. Amen. Action. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to be able to speak to you through social media here. Uh, many thanks to Shannon Helzer, who's video ending, videoing this uh, uh, today. Uh, just a few housekeeping things. Um, first of all, please know that you are all in our prayers in this very difficult, challenging uh, time. Uh, we know there's a lot of anxiety out there. And uh, one of the things that uh, bothers me the most as a pastor is uh, the inability to really be with you in person, face to face. And uh, many of you know that I am very much a one on one person. Uh, and uh, so this is a whole new experience for me. But uh, please know that I love you all and you're in my heart. And uh, I think of you every day. And uh, please know that I'm available with any concern or uh, just to give me a call uh, with any need and uh, be glad to, to pray with you too over the telephone. But please know that all of our church leadership and, and staff uh, are keeping you in our prayers. And uh, we love you all here, members and friends of Calvary Baptist Church. And, uh, and we pray that uh, others would be blessed too through this uh, series of messages that uh, I'm giving on the I Am sayings of Jesus. Baptisms uh, have been scheduled for Easter Sunday, but uh, we uh, know that uh, that probably will not be the case now uh, because of the coronavirus situation. Uh, those of you being baptized, uh, please know that uh, I will be available uh, on the first Sunday that uh, we can open uh, safely. Uh, so uh, I will be in touch with uh, all of you uh, concerning that. Also in this coming week, we're going to be sending out Lenten uh, devotionals, um, just uh, some scripture passages and some personal thoughts from myself for Palm Sunday, Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday. Uh, so be looking for that, members of the church uh, and friends of the church uh, in the mail. And uh, we hope that will be a help to you um, as we'll be spending uh, undoubtedly a uh, holy week in our homes. Also for Palm Sunday, um, I'll ask you to have some bread and some juice available in your homes uh, because I will be delivering the sermon from uh, behind the altar in the church sanctuary and uh, we'll be leading uh, into communion uh, following my, my message. Uh, so you want to join in uh, on Palm Sunday uh, and you'll find uh, uh, again the messages on, on YouTube. Just go to our church uh, uh, website, uh, Calvary Baptist Church uh, Allentown and uh, um, you'll see the connection there to click on for YouTube. All right, well, we're continuing the I Am sayings of Jesus. And in past weeks, we looked at uh, Jesus uh, uh, having said uh, that uh, he's the bread of life, I am the bread of life, and then I am the light of the world, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the life. And, uh, and so this morning, I just want to speak uh, on Jesus' saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And our scripture comes from John 14, verse 1 to 7. 
Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my Father's house. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and receive you, so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I am going. No, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. There's an absolute nature to these words of Jesus when he declares, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They're powerful words, controversial words in a way, because Jesus did not say, I am one of the ways, or one of the truths, or just one life among so many other lives. No, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus uh, has the same title as, as God. He said on one occasion in the Gospels, Before Abraham was, I am. When Moses was on Mount Sinai, he heard the voice of God. And God told Moses to go and to liberate the Israelites from bondage. And uh, Moses asked God, uh, Whom shall I tell the people that sent me? And God said to tell them, I am sent you. And so this was a... a a title for God. Jesus and the Father are one. And uh, the Bible states that Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. And if we want to know what God is like, then we look to Jesus. Now there are those who claim that all religions lead to God, and it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. And that in a religious, pluralistic society, we must all exercise tolerance. And I understand that statement because we do have to exercise tolerance in a democracy. We have many people uh, from many different faiths here in this land. And uh, we have to love people as Christ uh, loves people. And uh, we have to be caring and compassionate to others. In fact, uh, I was, I've been reading the book, The God We Can Know, Exploring the I Am Sayings of Jesus by Rob Fuquay. And it's a very good book that I recommend on the I Am Sayings of Jesus. But he says something here uh, that's very interesting to me that I want to highlight. And on page 91 of his book, he says, In a world where their belief was in the minority, early Christians needed confirmation that their faith was valid. And John 14, verse 6, affirms their faith. When Jesus declares, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he goes on to say, I quote, Instead of being used as weapons to convince others that they are wrong, these words were meant to assure Christ's followers that their faith was genuine, their connection to Christ real, and their path one that leads to the Father. And then he says, but, at, at, but and this is a big but, <laughs> that still doesn't minimize the exclusive nature of Christ's words, no one comes to the Father except through me. Now some people employ the rainbow analogy, saying that every religion is a color and all together make a rainbow, and that there are many gates to the eternal city, and proponents believe you can enter through Confucius, Plato, Muhammad, Moses, the Buddha, or Jesus, just as you prefer. But I would say to you that religious toleration does not mean equal validity of truth. Because in Christianity, we're confronted with the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. And so at the heart of our faith stands the person and work of Jesus, which is utterly unique. Uh, Buddha, for instance, never claimed to be anything more than a man. Muhammad claimed nothing more than to be a prophet. Confucius was, was a mortal. If Christ was in fact God incarnate, which is what we declare and believe in the Christian community, 
then we cannot ascribe equal honor to all others. As Paul Little writes in his book, Know Why You Believe, to ascribe equal honor to others would necessitate either falsely attributing to mortal man the attributes of deity or stripping Christ of his divine nature. So, in the truth claims of Christianity, we find the notion of the sinlessness of Christ. And that alone puts Jesus Christ above everyone else. If Jesus had no other uniqueness, this one factor, his sinlessness, would set him apart from every religious leader the world has ever known. And then in the truth claims of Christianity, the fact of Christ's resurrection is vital. Because if Christ had not been raised from the dead, then he would not have the credential or certification. And Jesus possesses that certification. No other religious leader can claim that uh, truth. And so according to the truth claim of Christianity, Christ is alive. He's been vindicated by the resurrection. He lives in the hearts of his people. And then in the truth claims of Christianity is the uniqueness of Christ in the work of the atonement. Moses, uh, for instance, could, could mediate on the law. Mohammed could brandish a sword. Buddha could give personal counsel. Confucius could offer wise sayings. But none of these people qualify to offer an atonement for the sins of the world. And so Christ's death was made as a payment for the sins of mankind. His sacrifice was perfect. And so there's a direct correlation between the uniqueness of his person of his sinlessness, of his atoning death and sacrifice, and of his resurrection. And together these factors describe the only begotten Son of the Father, the Word made flesh, who came to dwell among us full of grace and truth. And so Christ's total value sets him apart from all pretenders to the throne. The esteemed Catholic theologian Thomas Akempis caught the meaning of Jesus' words and said this about them, quote, Without the way there is no going, without the truth there is no knowing, and without the life there is no living, unquote. The disciples of Jesus were in desperate need of stability and reassurance. Jesus had shared with them his impending death at the scene of the Last Supper. And the words of our text from the scriptures are a part of his farewell discourse to the disciples. Everything the disciples had known in the way of personal security seemed to be evaporating before their eyes. The enemies of Jesus were calling for his death, for his execution, for his crucifixion. What to do? Where to turn? And so what did Jesus do in this situation? He spoke words of encouragement to the disciples. He called his disciples to a place of trust. Thomas asked for Jesus to show him the way. Philip voiced a longing for the comforting certainty of God's presence. Each disciple in his own way was pleading for reassurance that things would be okay. And Jesus knew that if they could trust him, things would be all right. Why? Well, because Jesus and the Heavenly Father are inextricably linked. If they can trust Jesus, they can trust the Father. If they can trust Him, not only will their Heavenly Father provide for them in the next life, God will provide abundantly for their needs in this life. Seasons of upheaval come to all of us in this broken world. A lot of things happen beyond our control, as we are experiencing with the coronavirus. Sickness, loss, and our hearts go out to those who have lost loved ones in this crisis. Relational crises, economic implosion. Life is filled with upheavals and we're experiencing them right now. What to do? Where to turn? And I would say to Christ, to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life in all situations. Not just life for the future, but, but for right now and the experience we're going through. The early Christians experienced that 
And, and because of their devotion to the Lord, they were called followers of the way. It's interesting how the word Christian has become so politicized, even demonized today. Pastor and author Max Lucado, and uh, also a sociology professor I had at Eastern University, Tony Campolo, they get much more of a positive response when they tell people they're followers of Jesus Christ rather than saying, I'm a Christian. And uh, it's, uh, it's a pertinent thing to mention. And remember that people were called uh, followers of the way, uh, followers of Jesus before they were called Christians. And what did these early believers do? And what did the disciples do as followers of Jesus Christ, as followers of the way? Well, they affirmed Jesus as the way to know God. Jesus told the disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus said on one occasion that to have eternal life was to know God. And when Jesus says, I am the way, he tells us that, that he is the way to know God. So God need not be an unapproachable mystery and being to us. If you know me, Jesus says, you know the Father. And then the disciples affirm Jesus as the way to eternal life. Jesus is our bridge builder, having reconciled us to the Father through his sacrifice on the cross for our sins. Sometimes uh, on a Christmas Eve, uh, I love to watch the Midnight Mass um, from uh, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And the word Pope uh, is pontiff. And the word pontiff means bridge builder. But it seems to me that Christ is the supreme pontiff. For he in his suffering and sacrifice has bridged the gulf of separation between God and the world. And no matter what happens this side of heaven, Separation is not forever, because the Lord has prepared a place for, uh, for us in his kingdom, and we will experience the joy of reunion with him. And Jesus wanted to give the disciples that trust and that assurance before he went to the cross. But the disciples not only affirmed Jesus as the way to eternal life, they affirmed the life and ministry of Jesus as the way for us to live our lives right now. And the way of Jesus is the way of sacrificial love. Unbelievers were so impressed with the Christians and first century Christianity that they declared, see how they love one another. They are following the way of the man named Jesus. So living the way of Jesus, which is the way of sacrificial love, is something we're called to do 24-7. I heard the story about a nurse in a New York hospital, a male nurse who died of the coronavirus and he contracted it in the hospital while caring for patients. He was a young man and he would minister to patients. He would give some of them a hug while caring for them, knowing that none of, his, none of the loved ones of these patients could come in lest they become contaminated. But this nurse himself took great risks, and those are the risks that go with the profession. And he cared, and he offered sacrificial love to people who needed it and needed to experience it in those situations. When we see Jesus, we see sacrificial love in action. We see the Lord's love restoring the fallen, welcoming the prodigal freeing the captive, healing diseases, giving new life and hope to all. And Jesus himself said that people would know whom we follow by our love as his followers for another. By this shall all people know that you are my disciples by your love for one another, Jesus said. I remember Tony Campolo sharing something years ago on the Odyssey channel on television. He said, quote, Jesus broke into history not to demonstrate his power. He came to express God's love, unquote. 
All of the miracles Jesus performed were not performed just to demonstrate his power, but to express God's love for people in difficult situations. And, and we, we can't uh, engage in the ministry of Jesus like walking literally on water or literally raising someone from the dead. But there are things we can do, and that is taking every opportunity we can to express love to others, the love of Christ to others. And when it comes to the bottom line, we need to be more committed to expressing love than showing off power. Tony uh, Campolo told the story of a trip to Haiti. And Tony's been involved with, uh, with mission work in Haiti and the Dominican Republic for many, many years. And he told uh, the story of the trip he took on one occasion and to help out with the 75 small schools that had been started to help some of the neediest people in the world. He was preparing to come back to the United States from Haiti and had just taken a taxi to a small Holiday Inn where he always stayed the night before he returned to the United States so he could shower and clean up. As he was walking from the taxi with his baggage, he was intercepted by three girls, none of whom was older than 15. The girl in the middle said, Mr. I'll do anything you want me to do for $10. Do you know what I mean? Well, Tony Campolo knew exactly what she meant, and he turned to the next girl and he asked, and what about you? Is it $10 for you too? She said, yes. And the third girl said the same, and, and Tony said, I'm in room 210, and you all be up there in 10 minutes. I have $30, and I'm going to pay you to be with me all night long. Now, Tony went, and he spoke to the manager of the Holiday Inn. He told him what he was going to do so there wouldn't be any misunderstanding whatsoever. He rushed up to his room and then he telephoned the hotel staff to arrange for them to bring every Walt Disney movie they could get their hands on, along with four huge banana splits with everything on them. And so the girls came, totally unexpecting the manner in which they would be treated. They ate ice cream with Tony. They watched some wonderful movies together. They shared stories about their lives together. They laughed and they cried together. And these girls never felt so valued in their life. It was the most significant experience of the lives of these three young girls because they were treated as human beings and not as objects. They were treated as beloved children. They were treated with care and with real Christian love. And Tony said, I laughed and cried with them all night until the last of them plopped down and fell asleep. And as I saw those precious girls, there I thought to myself, nothing's changed, nothing's changed, because tomorrow they will be back on the street selling their bodies to some filthy-minded people who for a few dollars will destroy them. But Tony said, I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit say, Thank you, Tony. Because for at least one night, somebody allowed three of my precious children to be little girls again. If Jesus was to make a decision, which is the greater work? Walking on water or giving one night of childhood back to three little girls who had it robbed from them? Giving one night of joy to three little girls that armies had marched over? Which do you think Jesus would consider the greater work? You see, Jesus said in verse 12 of our scripture, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. The work that I do, you will do. And greater works than these shall you do because I go to the Father. We can't replicate the power acts of God in Jesus Christ. But every time we perform an act of love in his name, we are imitating Jesus. We are following the way. Yes, Jesus is the way. He is the truth. He doesn't only speak the truth about God. He doesn't only speak truth to power. He embodies truth. And John makes that point in his opening chapter of his gospel. Chapter 1, verse 14. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. 
We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. It's important to note that grace and truth are connected. Years ago, theologian Paul Tillich, in his book, The New Being, highlighted that importance in a similar fashion when he wrote, quote, Distrust every claim for truth where you do not see truth united with love. Be certain that you are of the truth and that the truth has taken hold of you only when love has taken hold of you and has started to make you free from yourselves, unquote. When Jesus was on trial before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor asked Jesus, what is truth? For Jesus, this was no time for debate or definition, because the truth was right there, staring him in the eye, standing before Pontius Pilate in the person of Jesus. On a previous occasion, Jesus said, I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And in John 8, verse 31, 32, we hear Jesus saying to the disciples, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth embodied in Jesus has come to set us free from our sins and from everything that is dehumanizing. He comes to set us free from our fears and even from death itself. There are so many people who live in bondage to one thing or another and the encouragement is to come to Christ who is the one to free you, the one who is the, the way, the one who is the truth, the one who is the life. Yes, Jesus is life to us, not just in the future, but right now. Life is more than just mere survival, which is kind of the mode that I see a lot of people in right now. The Gospel of John celebrates the way in which Jesus' presence renews people's lives. In unexpected acts of mercy and love, and always in the ordinary events of life. In Christ, God has made it possible for us to move from mere existing into abundance of life. We're all in this kind of a rut right now, trying to find our way through this coronavirus. We want the truth to be told to us, the unvarnished truth, and we're all looking for life and we want to live it in not these restrictive ways in which we need to right now because of the seriousness of this virus. But at the same time, we celebrate the life of Christ within us. It's like the Apostle Paul writes, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We always carry the life of Christ within us. And we're always given opportunity, no matter what situation we're in, to live the life of Christ. Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And that includes abundance of joy, abundance of purpose, abundance of peace. Because we are abiding in him who is the way, the truth, and the life. I always experience these things as a pastor, especially when I make hospital visitations and I often find a, a person of faith in a room and then there'll be another person in the room who struggles with any sense of faith and, and, uh, and, and, and they're angry and, and they're frustrated and they're negative and then so many times I see people of faith in exactly the same situations physically struggling with exactly the same health situation and yet they have this inner peace and uh, and where others are looking at frustration and negative thoughts they're staying positive counting their blessings and that no matter what happens they have this peace about them knowing that they're in God's hands and God's hand will never let go of them and that's what I pray for everyone, even in this situation. Know that you're loved, that you're loved, 
that there is a God in Christ who really loves you, um, that there are people of God who live their lives authentically before others um, with sacrificial love. And you can look at how um, the power of God's love is being manifested in their lives and attitudes and actions. And, uh, and you can be blessed through that knowing that there is a way that we can live our lives with purpose and joy because the presence of Christ is real, the power of his resurrection is real, and as we look to the Lenten, through this Lenten season and into Holy Week, um, we move through all of these emotions of uh, frustration and, and, and darkness and, and uh, struggle um, that we go through as human beings, um, but we can come out the other side with, with hope, with love, with light, because the great I Am is with us, because Jesus has promised never to leave us or to forsake us. If you don't have a trusting relationship with Christ today, I would want to encourage you to open your heart uh, to, to have that, to receive that, and it begins simply by acknowledging your need and turning to Christ, acknowledging that He is uh, the Savior, um, from our sins and believing that uh, God has sent him to be the Messiah, the Savior for you as he has for the whole world. Believe in him and, and trust in him. I know I found his presence to be very real in my life through all of the ups and downs of my own life and my own experiences. And uh, I'm retiring soon. Um, as a pastor of Calvary Baptist Church, um, but will maintain my membership here. And uh, I'm going to be writing a book about signs of God's presence from my own life experiences um, that uh, I want to share with people, uh, not just pe with people of faith, but especially too for people who are struggling with, with uh, any kind of belief or, or faith in their lives. And... Uh, just to let people know that, that there is a living God that they can believe in and, and trust in. And whether you've been a Christian for decades or whether someone needs to take that first step today, the word of Jesus to you is clear as it was to the disciples. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, Jesus says, believe also in me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Come to me and I'll lead you to God. I am the way of salvation. Come to me and you will find the truth. Come to me and you will find life in all of its fullness. Please bow in prayer with me. Gracious Lord and God, we give thanks that you sent Jesus to be our Savior, to be Lord in our lives. We give thanks that he expressed the great I am to us. We give thanks, Lord, for your promises in Scripture. We give thanks that you are the way, the truth, and the life, that we can know you personally. We give thanks that your light is there, even in this the darkness of the coronavirus and the frustration uh, so many are going through and the threats that yet remain. We continue to pray for wisdom, for guidance, uh, for our leaders. We continue to pray for our scientists, uh, people in the medical community, researchers, uh, who are seeking uh, uh, an answer to this virus, a vaccine. And, uh, and we pray that uh, that would be possible. We know it will take some time. Um, be with not only this nation, but all the nations of the world who are struggling with the same things that we are. We uh, pray for, for people everywhere. And uh, we pray for people to do all they can to express kindness and support to one another in this trying time. We pray that people would exercise caution, that they would listen to uh, all of the experts in the medical community, that we would be uh, exercising uh, uh, proper hygiene, uh, uh, washing our hands, uh, maintaining the social distancing we need to right now, um, calling... Uh, uh, our physician or the doctor's office um, when we need to as we're uh, uh, when we uh, experience symptoms uh, that are serious and uh, just be with all of us as we exercise care and 
So we just heard a message from Pastor Marty in which Jesus states, I am the way, the truth, and the light, and the life. Many people right now are anxious or nervous because of the COVID. And perhaps you might be thinking about what does it mean to be a Christian? Or what does it mean to be saved? So in the next few minutes at the end of the Pastor Marty series, uh, I will be going over a few simple steps. So if you ever thought about becoming a Christian, if your mortality is in question and you're now wondering what is there after, I'll be going through some few simple steps to show you how you can become a Christian, a believer in Jesus, if that's what you decide you want to do. So I mentioned that I would take a minute or so to go through the steps on becoming a Christian and what it is that we want to consider when we become a Christian. To do this, I'm going to look at the ABC of salvation. The ABC of salvation is a model, just a general guide on the things that we need to understand before we pray to become a Christian. In this model, A means to admit, B means to believe, and C means to confess. So we're going to take a little time and look at each one of these individually so that we understand what we are actually doing if we are electing to become a Christian, if we want to feel called a Christian or if we feel that we've been called to become a Christian. The first one is A, admit. When we do this, we admit that we are a sinner and that we have knowingly and unknowingly done wrong in our life. So in other words, we violated the commands of God. It's what we call sin. Then B stands for believe. We believe in Jesus and put our trust in him and believe that Christ died for us, taking on all of our sins when he died on the cross. He was the sacrifice in our place. Then we confess. We confess our sins to God the Father and accept Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So those are the elements, the things that we should understand before we undertake to answer the call that we may be experiencing to become a Christian. When we're ready, we pray what we call the sinner's prayer. The sinner's prayer, one example, there's many examples as long as they contain those basic ABC elements. So the basic example is, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask you for your forgiveness. I believe you died for me my, for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and to follow you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So if you felt called to say this prayer or moved to do it, you know, this is only the first step. And it's important that you grow. The best way to grow is by reading and researching as much as you can. So here are a couple of links I've provided for you to help you research the, the, the sinner's prayer and also some basic other information about becoming a Christian that you should know. And then most importantly, at the bottom, you should have your Bible. If you want to become a Christian, you don't want to say a baby Christian. Your food and growing, God has provided through the Holy Bible. Thank you for taking the time to look at me. And now let's return to our regular service. Thank you again for joining us here at Calvary Baptist Church. And we look forward to seeing you again for next week's service. And for services as long as the COVID virus continues. Have a good day. Under his wings I am safely abiding Though the night deepens and tempests are wild Still I can trust him, I know he will keep me He has redeemed me and I am his child under his wings, under his wings, who from his love can sever? Under his wings, my soul shall abide, safely abide forever. His wings, oh, what precious enjoyment!
there will I hide till life's trials are o'er. Sheltered, protected, no evil can harm me. Resting in Jesus, I'm safe evermore. Under his wings, under his wings, who from his love can sever. Under his wings, my soul shall abide. Bye.